Welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Spencer Stebbins. I'm the head of training. At my pleasure to introduce our next speakers, Brian Mearns and Kirk Hassel Hasselbeck from uh, the co-founders of OWL Analytics. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Brian and Kirk. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Fine, Kirk. All right, great, great. Well, we're amped up today. Brian and I are gonna talk about all the challenges of data quality, sort of an old topic that's been reinvented with AI and data science. And we lived this for you know, about a decade or so in different industries. Mine was particular to Wall Street and all the problems with trading and transactional data and market data and, and Brian's in the media and cyberspace. And so we're gonna talk about all those lessons learned and, and how rules didn't really scale for us and how we were able to use kind of a practical AI, real data science and machine learning to solve the problem. So let me go ahead and start to share some materials. Share screen. Looks like it's uh, sharing okay. Is it okay for you, Brian? I can see it. Yep. Looks good. Yeah, absolutely. So, what we want to do is talk about predictive data quality and what that really means. And you know, in the past, we used to have humans that write rules of what we think and can assume about the data. But, you know, why not use the data itself to generate the rules? And why not learn from the past to become incrementally smarter each day with your data quality projects, your governance initiatives, and, you know, all of the things that are surrounding the challenges with a data lake. So what we found in our daily lives for a long time was that the data is usually not 100% correct. It often goes out that way and it goes downstream to a compliance officer or a business analyst. It could be somebody reading a report, could be somebody looking at quarterly earnings, could be getting a bill from you as a customer, or it could be you know someone internal that's looking at a BI dashboard trying to get better insights about their business. And they come knocking on your door and say, the data is not right, I don't trust it, I care a lot less about whether the bar chart is orange or blue, and a lot more about the accuracy of these components. Are they consistent? Are they complete? Are they accurate? And can I trust the data? Because if I can't trust it, I can't make business decisions and I can't be a data-driven business because of it. So they run over to the data scientists, the data modelers, the programmers, and say, what happened? What changed this week? Oftentimes, they look at the version control systems and say, not much has changed. And the little bit that has would not have led to this issue. We, we think we're okay. And then you might end up huddled over the DBA and the data engineers and the data quality people's desk and say, well, let's look through all the rules. How did this get past us? And do we need to add a 301 th rule to our rules and you know data quality data set of all the things that we've tried to put together about what we think we know about this problem? So a simple example might be we have a million rows of data and we go and write a rule that says it should never be less than a million and it grows to 1.2 million and then one day it grows to 2 million and then it drops back down to 1.5. We've lost a quarter of the data, but it still passes the rule. And as we go through and write null checks and more complex rules, we often find that not only was it a challenge to write all of these rules, it required a technical person and a business domain expert. And then oftentimes that rule becomes invalid or expires. So the rule doesn't just have to be written, it has to be managed and validated over time. Uh, so in every sub-department we worked with, and we work with many Fortune 50 companies, there was always about 7,000 rules that needed to be written. And it always took more than 2,000 man hours of these combined experts' time. And the chief data officer really only ever felt like he got 30% coverage. So that's really our problem statement. That's what LDQ is after to solve. And we want to use more advanced techniques to do it than these traditional approaches. So what we found ourselves commonly asking is, we all want good data. We wanna write those exciting models on good data, 
but how can we be so sure? And we really just need a simple mechanism that alerts us when strange things are happening in our data. And so we started to use AI and then we found it was great in some cases, but not always as explainable as we wanted it to be. So we could see here this, this red line drifting away from the blue line. And we could talk about data drift in a minute, but really at this point, it could happen suddenly overnight. It could be batches of data. It could be subsections of data that go missing or change or become inaccurate. But we needed a way to detect all of these and then explain them to the analyst. And it turned out the most popular and explainable language is probably SQL at this point in time. So Al uses AI and ML to detect and learn from the user's feedback but then it creates explainable SQL statements so that if you wanted to drop them in as simple rules or at least hit export and take them to your compliance or regulatory authority, you could, and it would be in a universal language that at this point is ANSI compliant and fairly understandable. So part of the challenge of this problem is to first connect to the data sources. So one of the things that I will do as soon as you add the JDBC connection or add any type of connectivity to a data source, and that could be Hive, could be Oracle, could be Teradata, DB2, Kafka queues, or any file system, it's going to start to generate a profile. But what's so great about this profile is it's agnostic to the data source. We're no longer worried about if in a file an empty is represented one way, but that's a null in a database, or if it's a string to a car, to a decimal, to a double. Al has made all of this agnostic so that it can be measured in a unified way, and it will build these profiles over time and allow us to drill in immediately and see correlation matrices, histograms, profile stats, filtergrams, but that's really just table stakes. It then builds an insight layer on top of those profiles and auto generates the rules, which are based on what it has learned from the data over time. So we can see the acceptable range, it's learning weekend trends, and then all of a sudden there might be catastrophic, catastrophic events that are egregious to those normal behaviors. And then on top of that insight layer, there's alerting. And that's how we're graduating raw data through an unsupervised discovery process, using humans to add those labels and graduating some of those models internally to a supervised learning process, and then calibrating the rules appropriately and letting the users interact with that insight layer. So maybe a more real world example in OWL might look something like this, where we have a timeline, because we believe that data should be profiled in the rhythm in which it's loaded. If you take a year of good and bad data and distill it down to just one event on the timeline, uh, you've really merged a lot of things and you've made it meaningless. So ultimately we have a replay feature that can catch up even if you're already a year behind and using AI or ML on your data in the first run. And what it will do is show when your data started to drift away from its accurate baseline and what happened at that time. And what we can see by drilling in, Al is showing us that there is a credit rating category for bank loans called excellent, but it's been misspelled or someone has somehow entered it into the system and it's a new category. And th this could wreak havoc because we could see over history, this category hasn't been here and we could misallocate somebody's loan to the wrong rating, which could ultimately maybe give them the wrong rate or the wrong approval. Um, and then we would see here measures of completeness, uh, auto discovery on data shapes, outliers, and much more. So go ahead, Brian. Sounds like you want to jump in. Yeah, it might be a good time just to get some some questions from the field. Uh, feel free to drop them in the in the chat as well. But there's a couple that came in in advance. Uh, so this can work on streaming or S3 buckets. Or are there any limits to the, the types of data? Yeah, mostly there are not limits. Uh, all JSON, XML, a CSV, or any delimited field, S3 buckets, all major cloud storages, blobs, uh, and anything with a JDBC connection. So if, if someone has anything more specific on that one, but even systems like MongoDB and Redshift are supported. Got it. And then somebody else mentioned, so it finds 
anomalies, can I interact or flag those anomalies? Yeah, absolutely. Everything that Al finds, you first can annotate it. You might want to give it that helpful message that this is okay for this reason. And then you sort of click the, the up or down that says, was this good or bad to help us get incrementally smarter? And we do have an internal queue. So you can add it to a workflow uh, or integrate it with ServiceNow. We see about a 50-50 split in the market of using Al's workflow versus uh, Al's integration with ServiceNow. Got it. And then last, last one, I think you mentioned alerting, but you know, what would be the ideal use case for a, a data scientist um, whether it's a small team, maybe you know, lo understand from a small team perspective and then from a larger organization perspective. Um, well, ultimately, we're doing a lot of the work of a data scientist, and that's helping not create data science projects for, um, we, we think really the data scientist should be focused on predicting credit card fraud or doing that thing that the, the bank or the insurance company or the healthcare company does best. But really feeding those models needs to be good data quality. So ultimately what we do is we sort of lay that out into personas. And you might have an IT admin that sets up the JDBC connections and make sure you're connected to the data sources. You might have an observer, which is really your manager. And it could be the chief data officer. It could just be the executive director. And then there's an analyst. And the analyst would know the intimacy of the data, the columns, when something is right or wrong, and would help build those rules. And we found without really playing into these personas, people don't always know who should take ownership of which part of this problem. Did that answer the question? I, I might have uh, went on a little long there. Yeah, I think so. I'd love to hear from from anyone in the audience. You know what you're thinking. Um, along the way, were there any other questions maybe that weren't covered? Well, I think what I'll do while you're collecting those questions, just jump in um, and I'll, I'll jump over to the application itself. Let me, uh, let me log in here. It's been a little while. Okay, here's one. Does this run locally? Does it have to be on cloud? We run both in public and private cloud, and private cloud is a fancy word for, word for on-prem. And uh, a lot of our Fortune 50s are still on-prem, and um, we're probably about a 50-50 split. So it, it is software that runs in containers in pretty much any environment at this point. So here you can see all the, the connections and we would go through when we would start to just take over data sets or entire databases at a time. We would open this up, click go. Al would go to its jobs page, orchestrate a number of jobs that would go out and just start creating profiles and data quality metrics.